Welcome to today's session. I am Audra Mitchell, yeah, head of the Massey Learning Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session. I am Audra Mitchell, head of the Massey Learning Institute, and on behalf of the MLI team, we thank you for making the time to join us today. As we continue to explore the topic, addiction and family recovery. Before I continue, just want to share the um, apologies there seems to be some internet challenges today, so we are really hoping that it would not interfere with our experience today. So as we explore this topic of addiction and family recovery, to lead us in this exploration, it is my privilege to welcome back and reintroduce today's presenter, Ms. Hulsi Bagan. Hulsi is the Clinical Director of the New Life Ministries Treatment and Rehabilitation Center. She co-hosts a television program entitled Addicted. And as I hand you over to Hulsi, please be reminded that the Q&A segment will take place at the end of the presentation. So Hulsi, a warm welcome back. Thank you, Audra, and welcome everyone. I hope you're having a good day today. And our topic is addiction and family recovery. So the first thing we need to look at is how does addiction affect a family? And one of the things we all recognize is that everyone who is in a family is a family member is affected in some form or the other. So, for example, families' finances are affected. You will find, for example, that psychologically persons are feeling upset, depressed. Persons' physical health are also physically um, damaged. You may also find that within the family circle, what happens is that as they are coping with the addiction, you may find that family members start to assume different roles. Now, some family members may actually leave the, the home and move on because they cannot cope. But those who stay in the home or in fact, even the wider family circle, they may actually assume roles to be able to cope with the current situation. One of the first roles is that of the enabler. Now, who is an enabler? An enabler is someone who will actually try to protect the addict from the consequences of his addiction. And let us say, for example, this is someone in a workplace, and let us say the person does not come out to work on a Monday or every Monday, because usually addiction is more um, pronounced during a weekend. 
And when the person doesn't come out, the neighbor will call the employer and say, well, this person is ill or this person has had an accident. So they will constantly make excuses for the person. Then when the person gets into debt, they will pay off their debts. Uh, if persons come to the door asking for money because the person took money from them, they will find ways to cover up. And basically, you're looking at a situation where the enabler is in denial. They are thinking, well, you know, if I help this person, somehow they will get it together and they will no longer use the substance. The second role that persons may actually play would be the role of the hero. And generally, this takes place among older children. So it might be an older child, maybe the eldest in the family. And this, fam this person actually assumes the role of the parent or the adult who is on drugs. So they take on all the responsibilities and they ensure that everything is perfect. And what you may find is that the hero tends to move towards overachievement and perfection. And this, of course, becomes more and more difficult for the hero as the addiction progresses. Another aspect of the um, role that people play would be where the child in the family, one of the children actually might be the youngest child, will often now start to become the scapegoat. So it is a way of distracting attention away from the addict. And so this child will constantly misbehave, may get into problems in school, uh, at home. And what you may find a child like this who is left unattended with no kind of support and help may eventually end up in a situation where they get into problems with the law. So the scapegoat is this person is always in school. Somebody has to be called in to deal with it. And that is another role that people may assume. Another role that family members assume is the mascot or the comedian. And so because of the addiction is becoming worse, you may find that the way these people cope, one person becomes a comedian. One person starts to make the joke, um, finds everything funny, even makes jokes at the addict. And what happens is that the mascot or the comedian brings some sense of relief to the family to ease the tension. Because when an addict is in a home, there's a lot of family attention, intention. Finally, there is something called a lost child. And who is a lost child? Well, a lost child is the quiet one, the one who isolates himself or herself, who might go into the room and read or play with the internet or the phone, finding ways to escape from the reality. And the lost child sometimes may actually engage in fantasy play. The whole idea is to distract himself or herself from what is going on at home. And this is a child who will feel left out, will be under the radar, while the rest of the family is focused on the addict and their problems. One of the key things to recognize with an addict and a family is that because this person is bringing so much pain and grief and suffering to the family, everybody tends to be focused on the addict. Therefore, certain members of the family get left out. So the lost child might be one of those who found himself or herself under the radar. And this, of course, could lead to serious problems in the, in the life of this child. So what really is enabling? Is enabling helping? Well, actually, no. Enabling really is where you actually, you're supporting the person to become more addicted to the substance or the behavior. So some questions you need to ask yourself if you believe you might be enabling. Firstly, are you taking being taken advantage of? Are you financially struggling because of this person? Do you avoid conflict or confrontation because of this person? So you tend to cover up for them all the time, make excuses for them. If you answer any of these questions or maybe two of these questions, the chances are you are enabling. And when you are enabling, it means the situation will get worse. So how can you help? You can help by many ways. One, tough love. So stop paying off the debts. Of course, I know we are going to be scared because we may think if we stop paying the debt, that person's life is in danger. Well, guess what? The addict knows that you are thinking that way. So he or she will continue to use substances knowing that you are going to bail him out of these tight positions. So you need to administer tough love. I know of situations in families when a person comes home drunk or high or having gambled, 
you ensure that they have a meal, they ensure that the bed is well made, and you provide all the, the amenities for them because you are thinking somehow if you show them love that they will change. It doesn't work like that. Someone who is addicted becomes very manipulative. Secondly, stop giving the addict any money or shelter. Hire an interventionist. In other words, hire someone who knows about addiction, who is trained in the field of addiction counseling and have that person come and set up a family meeting where the family and the interventionist and the client and the addict will sit together and you do a special type of meeting. Third, fourthly, research treatment centers and let the addict know that either you go into treatment or this will be the ultimatum. You'll have to leave the house, I can no longer give you money or whatever you feel will be most impactful on the addict and recommend to the addict in case the person decides I do not want to go into treatment, I don't want to go into rehab, 90 meetings in 90 days. These meetings are, if it's an alcoholic, Alcoholic Anonymous meetings. If it's any other form of narcotics or behavioral addiction, then Narcotics Anonymous. So you recommend that they go 90 meetings in 90 days. And if they don't agree to do this, then you, you got to then enforce the ultimatum. So what happens to families generally when they are suffering under the disease of addiction, where a family member is, is presenting all these problems to them? Well, without help, a whole range of things happen. As you can see here, there's feelings move from the blues right down to blaming other people, isolation. Then in terms of what happens, you may start with arguments and distrust to the point where it becomes so progressive that some family members may start becoming chronically depressed and they may actually be suicidal attempts. This is where you talk about the reaching the rock bottom. So not only the client reach rock bottom, but family members too. With help, however, there's a whole change where there's more joy and honesty and, and a sense of spiritual release and a whole lot of positive emotions develop. And as that happens, you may find that even the behaviors of the family members change. So one of the things we would like to do today in this webinar is to have a special guest present and she's going to share her journey in recovery, where she would have started off with uh, having a, a relative of hers who was under substance and all the traumas that she went through. Then as he went into treatment, what happened while in treatment, the challenges he still faced in treatment. And now that he's in recovery, where she's at today. So I'm very happy now to welcome to our program and our webinar, our special guest who is now going to share with you her story on dealing with addiction. Good morning. Um, all that Hulsi said is excellent because that is exactly what a person who is dealing with an addict goes through. Um, the first thing is the denial part of it. And at the beginning, uh, I was in total denial. I think my husband was more in denial than me because of course our addict was a young person. So we tended to want to cover it up a lot because it's very embarrassing, of course, to admit that you have an addict. And um, this caused a lot, a lot of tension in the family, uh, a lot of resentment from his two siblings and a lot of problems with husband and wife because, of course, you weren't on the same page. So this led to me especially getting into a very bad place where I totally crumbled because, of course, you go through um, a lot of self-blame. What did we do wrong? How did this happen? And as I say, I reached a stage where I was no longer functioning properly and I realized I needed to get some help. So I went to a psychiatrist for me and through her, I began to um, understand what addiction is, that it is a disease and that there was nothing that we did that caused it. So um, I got into some programs, some Naranon meetings that we have in Trinidad and that really I started to accept that there was a problem and that we had to do something about it. So as I say, the hardest part to us was getting um, husband and wife on the same page because you have to make some very, very tough decisions. And that of course caused a, a lot of tension, a lot of arguing, a lot of fighting. So it's very easy to say, let's ignore it, leave it, it will solve itself, just avoid that. And of course, the other siblings too, um, they get very resentful. 
they say some of the most awful things, of course, because they say what the addict is doing to the family and they feel that you as a parent are not doing enough. So um, it then reach, reaches a stage where you, as I say, have to make some tough decisions. And in our case, the addict did not want to get into recovery because he thought that he could handle it on his own. He had been into rehab when he was much younger, 17, and that one he went into willingly. But because he was now a lot older, 30, being an adult now, of course, he felt he had the, the choice to make whether he went into rehab or not. But we had, to, um, we had to make some really tough decisions and it was either out on the street or it would have been into a rehab. So very reluctantly, he did go into rehab and this was extremely challenging for us because not wanting to be there, it was a constant fight to keep him there. And we let him know that it was going to be rehab or on the street. So I think he realized that he had no other choice, but it was extremely mentally exhausting because every time we would go and visit, we would have the, um, the self blame, the why y'all are doing me this, I can do this on my own. And you really have to be tough and you just have to stick to the plan and you just have to really make up your mind that this is the only thing that's going to work for you, not for the addict, but for you and for your family. And if they leave the program, well, then they have to understand, and you have to understand that it means that they're going to be out on the street and that there's nothing you can do about it because there's something called the three C's. You didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. It's all up to the addict. So having gone through that hold, um, hold program here at the Mount, which was absolutely fabulous, we then came to the, um, the time where it was ready for him to leave. And he reached a point where I did not, I thought he needed to stay a little longer, but he um, mentally, I think he had made up his mind that he had done enough and he was going to, to be okay. So we had to trust him and he was um, not released, but he did graduate from the program. And since graduating, he has done really, really well. It is extremely challenging for the addict in our society to, to be around people. Marijuana is now so accepted. It's now legal and, and that's what they will tell you. And um, everything is revolved around drinking. You have a christening, let's drink. You have a death, let's drink. You have any function, let's drink. So that is extremely challenging for them. And in the back of your mind, you always have a little thing, is he going to relapse? Is he going to relapse? But this sense of um, serenity that the whole family now has, it's unbelievable. We have become a family again. My husband and I have gotten so much closer. Um, the other siblings have, have really understood the addiction. And one of them still is not really on board. He still blames the addict for all the pain that he caused in the family. But the sense of, as I say, serenity and the sense of calm, that we now have is just something that I always prayed we would get back. So that is my journey that, that we had. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I can say for you. The, the only thing is tough lovers, as he said, that's the only way to get through something like this. You have to set your boundaries and you have to stick to them. Once you start to cave it on those boundaries, the addict realizes that you are really a walk in the park and they will just do everything to keep stepping on you. So it's, it comes to a stage where it's no longer about the addict, it's about you and what you want for yourself. Can you live with it or do you have to do something about it? So what you saw, what you saw from our, my guest, you would have realized now, as you look at this chart before you, that she would have been able to touch on some of the key points raised in this particular um, graphic. For example, as I mentioned before, without help, the family progressively gets worse. And this is where, for example, if you look at the arguments with startup and what our guest spoke about is that within her family, her, the siblings started feeling resentful. They started feeling that they were being neglected because that's what happens. While we are all focused on the addict, the other family members get neglected. 
And so they have also needs. The family also becomes dysfunctional. Communication now becomes a, an issue. So there's more arguments, there's more distrust, people are feeling unhappy. What you may find in some cases, the family members then seek religious comfort. So they go deeper into religion. So sometimes you, they escape into other ways. And then of course the denial is a big one where we always feel, well, you know what? Eventually he will grow out of it. Eventually he'll reach a stage where he will know he needs to stop. But as you and I know, and as our guest just said, it is not that easy because if the person has become so chronic, they have reached a point of no return unless they get help. You may also find that sometimes the family members will threaten the addict, but will not carry out the threat. You may say, well, if you continue borrowing money, I'm no longer going to pay. And then somebody comes to the door and says, X owes me money, I need a thousand dollars, and you take it out and you pay. So the, the addict knows that you're not going to enforce that. So one of the things that you may find is that someone with an addiction issue becomes very good at judging character, becomes very good at reading your mind. So they know how they could manipulate you. What you may find, as I said before, the family now start taking responsibility for this person's actions. And whatever, the, whatever is left undone, you will pick up the slack. Family also start to lose interest in each other and illnesses prevail. So you may find that the families of somebody who is in active addiction may end up at a medical doctor's office constantly and they're getting painkillers, they're finding um, medication to sleep. So you may find a lot of comfort in medication and prescribed and non-prescription drugs. And a lot of the illnesses really could be psychosomatic or it could really be stress related. And then, of course, we have to mask the situation. So we put on the facade. So when we go to social events and somebody asks, well, how is X? You may say, well, he's fine. He's home. Well, why is he not here today? He's not well. Or he's sleeping or he has important things to do. So we find a way to cover up the situation because the, the whole concept of the elephant in the living room is there. The situation is there, but we do not want to deal with it. And then you may have this sense of loss of self-respect family members start thinking something is wrong with them. And as our guest said, you know, I did I, something, somehow I thought we did something which caused this person to be like this. There's remorse. So for example, if you were you exercise tough love, you're going to feel remorseful. But what happens too is that family members start to withdraw socially. Because when you go to your parties or events or, and so on, and people ask you about X, you are going to say you have to make an excuse and how many times will you use an excuse and you're feeling now this sense of loss of self-respect you're starting to doubt yourself you're feeling depressed so you are going to withdraw from social settings and what you may also find is that the, the family members themselves may succumb to some kind of addiction what happens also is that in cases where if a family member is also prone to suicidal attempts or maybe clinical depression, you may find in cases like that, persons may actually attempt suicide or commit suicide as it comes down to the bottom of the barrel. Of course, all the feelings that come about will be things like a sense of intolerance, you're constantly suspicious. And as our guest said, even though her um, son is in active recovery right now, she still wonders whether he's going to relapse because even though the person is in recovery and the person is doing well, because of the length of time that you have seen this person deteriorate, you still cannot believe that this person actually is staying clean and can stay clean. So there will constantly be that level of distrust, that level of suspicion, that, that even fear, fear of this person relapsing. And a very valuable point she made there was that she herself sought help because there are times when persons come to us and the addict does not want help. So what we do, we advise a family member to get help for themselves, to join the Al-Anon meetings or the Naranon meetings or see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist of some sort. But as a family member, it is important to educate yourself on addiction. And secondly, to save yourself. If the addict doesn't want to get into help, you save yourself. Because when you get that help, 
you are able to set boundaries. So if you are an enabler before, you will know now I don't need to enable this person anymore. I must exercise tough love. And our guest mentioned all of that in her own testimony about how she made the journey with her son from a point of active addiction to a point of recovery. And of course, recovery is beautiful. I must say I interact with her regularly. I interact with her son and it is such a wonderful thing to see the healing in the family, to see the relationships are so beautiful, to see her feeling so different, looking so different. Sometimes when family members come to our center at Mountain Benedict, you will find that you're not sure who is the client and who is the family member because all of them are looking so depleted. They look so unhappy. They look so much, you know, um, depressed. So when they are in recovery, though, there's a whole different kettle of fish. You will actually see in a client's face something called the glow of recovery. What does the glow of recovery mean? This is a person looking healthy, looking happy, who is smiling, who looks at peace. Now, I'm not saying at all that somebody who is in recovery is going to be in this mode forever. They are going to experience the down times. They are going to experience the lows. But guess what? Once you have been through a program and you have the tools, you will know how to manage the low times and bring you back to a point where you can feel totally at ease with life. So I hope today what I have shared and what um, my guests would have shared would have enlightened some of you in terms of what you need to do in case you do have a case like this. Or secondly, it gives you information so that you can help someone in need. So with that in mind, I now want to hand over to um, Rene, who will now take our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Halsey, and thank you to your guest as well for sharing that testimony. So our first question this morning, can you explain the term behavioral addiction? OK, so addiction takes two forms. It can be substances like alcohol, prescription drugs, cocaine, marijuana, marijuana, codeine and so on. Or it can be a behavioral addiction like gambling, pornography, um, shopping, workaholics, you know, working constantly, exercises. In our first webinar, we did a list of what a behavioral addiction. So you may not be addicted to a substance, but you're addicted to a behavior and the same symptoms apply. Uh, it is one where you, you're caught up in a spiral and you're not able to get out on it from it unless you get help. And it may have the same impact on your family members. It may not be as obvious in the early stages, but when you get to a point of rock bottom, that's when the money situation comes in, when the situations happen in the family, when you withdraw from the family circle, uh, persons whom you owe money may come to the place. If it's exercise, for example, your physical health may deteriorate and all other aspects of your life may be neglected. So once it starts to take a toll on the other aspects of your life, you may recognize something that may be a hobby may actually become an addiction. And that's how also gambling starts. You may have gone to the casino just for fun. And then maybe you won and, and then you went back another time and then over a period of time it became progressively worse. So behavioral addictions have to do with a behavior which becomes um, as addictive as the use of a substance. Thank you so much, Halsey. OK, so our next question is for. Our guests, how did you realize it was an addiction issue versus just drinking or smoking accessory. You know, we drink socially and we smoke every now and then. So how did you know that it was addiction at that point? Um, you see the person start to change. They, um, their moods change. Um, their aggression becomes a lot more noticeable. Um, you will notice they pull away from the family. I think that's, that's one of the main um, things that we saw. It's very distant, no communicating. And you can look at a person and see whether they're high or not, but definitely they start to pull away and um, they get very irritable. And you know, you you can you can see it. I mean, I can I can look at my son and see what way I could have looked at him and see where he was at. So you will you will pick up those signs once you start to admit something is wrong and you start to be a lot more open about that there may be a problem. You will see some of the signs showing up. OK, thank you so much. 
The next question we have. So I think you mentioned this just now, Halsey. Apart from drugs and alcohol, can persons be addicted to like virtual games or their tablet? For sure. All dimensions of the um, internet, all online issues, whether it's games, whether it's even your our phone or smartphones, uh, you can be addicted to Facebook, um, all these social media platforms. And this is really a form of escape. Remember when we become addicted, it's a form of escape. So it can be two things. If you are prone to a mental health issue like clinical depression or bipolar mood disorder or something, some of us self-medicate or we escape into something else that distracts us from the feelings that we are experiencing. So you can use anything to escape. And definitely one of the emerging trends currently um, is actually online games, any form of gaming, and which also include gambling, and as I said, social media platforms. Okay, great. One other question I have. So you mentioned tough love. So how do you get to the stage of tough love, knowing that it can bring harm to you or it can bring harm to the relationship that you have with the person? Um, you just reach a stage where you realize that your life is unmanageable, that the whole situation is unmanageable. Um, and then you, you, decide is this going to work for me? And you have to, to think about what you want in life. You didn't want this life for yourself, so why are you accepting that somebody else is giving you this life? You know, you have to, to look at your whole family dynamic. Are you gonna give up your, your whole other um, rest of your family for this one person? So you have to make some, some tough choices and it all comes down to what is working for you. So if I may add to that, um... Not everybody is able to do tough love. So one of the things my guest mentioned is where she sought help. So sometimes you would need to get professional help to bring you to that place where you can exercise tough love. Because some people, if they exercise tough love, they experience a lot of guilt. And when they experience guilt, then they go back to the old behavior. And then also the family, the extended family can blame you and say, but how could you put your son out? You know, he's out in the streets and you're living happily in your home. So other family members or even friends could pressure you too. So this is where once you have that ability now to draw the line and regardless of what pressures you get, you are saying, this is for my son's sake. This is how I help him. But you can, many people will need help first to get to that place to be able to ex experience tough love. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Here is our oh, I, I, um, Can I just say something too? A lot of the problem too is being, um, you think you're being judged by everybody and it's very easy for people who are not in a situation that you're in to give you advice and you're constantly being judged what you did was wrong, what you said was wrong, maybe the tone you used. So I think a lot of it too is that you have to decide as well um, that you have to, to really blank out other people and you have to work with somebody to get you through it. As um, Hulsi said, they are groups and they are doctors that are trained in this. And you just have to say, this is how we're moving forward. And you really have to distance yourself from those that are going to want to say that they can help and they don't have the training because a lot of people out there always feel that they know what's the best thing. And unless you walk this walk, you really don't know what the journey is going to be like. So you really should as well get a professional on board to help. That's some of the advice I can give as well. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I'll go on to our next question. Can you adopt more than one role? Enabler, hero, scapegoat? Certainly. Because uh, if especially you're the only person who is keeping this deep dark secret, Remember, for because what my guest said, the whole thing of shame and embarrassment that is associated, that are associated with addiction. So you could be battling all these roles in the home with this person alone. And because of that shame and embarrassment and you want to save face, you may not let people know. And this is where now it, might be, it may become so terrible that you can actually reach to a point of chronic depression because after a while you get so tired. 
you you are burned out. There's very little else for you to do. And so mentally and physically, and of course financially, you will find yourself totally depleted. And we have had many cases of family members by themselves struggling with an addict for years. And when I say years, I don't mean five years, sometimes 10 years, 15 years. We have had situations of addicts going in and out of prison, come back out. And what I've found over the years, mothers on their own can become really big enablers because mothers especially have this, this care and concern and love for their sons. And that is one of the biggest barriers for us in the center for treatment. And we have to reach these mothers and we have to help them. And I mean, I wish we had all the mothers like our guest today, where what she did and her husband and the family, they stood on the side of the center. What you may find is that sometimes when these family members come, the, the client or what we call a client will tell the family members all kinds of stories. The family members will believe them and take them out of the center. Then things get really bad and years later they turn up and this time it's really more difficult to help. So when the family members work along with the professionals and stay on their side, you will find that the client gets better help than if the family continues to enable them while they're still in treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Halsey. OK, so here's another question. Does an addict ever get completely clean to the point where they are no longer referred to as an addict? Well, addiction is considered a relapsable disease. And in our experience, we have had people who have been 20 years clean, 25 years clean, and they started to slip back into old ways, into old ways of thinking, into all kinds of lifestyles and it becomes easy to slip. So once you are in recovery, you're in recovery for the rest of your life. And what it really says is that you have to make a life change and there are certain things you, you, you can no longer do. So let us say if I'm a recovering alcoholic, there's a saying that says one drink is too many and a thousand drinks are not enough. So if I'm an alcoholic and I'm clean for 20 years, I still cannot afford to take one drink because once I take that one drink, my addiction is reactivated and I will relapse. And when I relapse, even I don't relapse the next day or the next week, as I continue drinking, it's going to get worse. And when I, my disease takes control of me, what you will find is that I don't start from the beginning with one beer and two beers. I will go back from where I had last stopped. So if I had been using three bottles of alcohol before I went into rehab, when I relapse, I'm going to start back with three bottles. That is how bad it is. So you're, you're not cured. But all it says is that you need to make life changes and you can do it. I, I know hundreds and maybe thousands of people who are doing it really well. And my guest just showed her son. He might be in early recovery, but guess what? He's one of the stories that will that I feel will do well because he has good family support because it is a family program and he himself today is motivated to stay clean. OK, great. Thank you. On to the next question. How do you deal with someone who has addiction in the workplace? Well, firstly, you are not a um, let us say as a, as a co-worker or maybe as a team lead, I am not a trained counselor. I am not a psychiatrist. I'm not an addiction counselor. So I cannot um, approach someone, say to them that they have an addiction problem. However, if they have an addiction issue, it is going to impact on their performance. So the employer has a leverage on the, in the um, performance level, drop in performance levels and productivity level. And once you're able to leverage on that and you give the person feedback, you have to then engage that person to a point where they may admit or you may actually recommend that they seek help of the EAP program, the employee assistance program. But ideally you cannot, unless they come, you know, drunk or maybe they are totally high and you can see all the physical um, signs. Still, even if you see the physical signs, I don't think industrial relations will allow you to just make a judgment. So another thing you may do in, in most organizations is to introduce a drug policy which includes random drug testing. So if someone 
turns up and they look as if something is, is going on with them, you take a sample of their urine and have it tested in a lab, so you have evidence with which to deal. So a drug policy will always be an important part of your process. Um, if I may just add though, if it's a behavioral addiction, like let's say gambling, you may see the signs because the person is gambling, but they're borrowing money from everybody, including co-workers. Um, and they might start stealing in the organization. So those are some of the visible signs that you may look for. And again, in a case like that, you will need to have an intervention where the person's job performance is dropping. OK, great. Thank you. On to our next question now. Can you explain rehab options other than going into a program away from home? Yes, there are many options. Um, there are outpatient programs where you can actually be professional. Secondly, there are the meetings. I, I spoke about 90 meetings in 90 days. There are the Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, generally, what you may find if somebody is chronic, outpatient programs and meetings may not be the most useful in the early stages. So if the person is chronic, they really should enter re residential rehab. When they complete a residential rehab, generally it takes about two years to make the, the sustainable changes. So then now they go to their um, aftercare meetings, if that rehab you know, offers aftercare meetings, and they then, they then join the self-help groups like any and AE. So um, outpatient will be for those who might be at risk or experimenting. But once you are chronic, it is better you go fully into a rehab, get yourself together, or else you'll be off the wagon, on the wagon constantly until things become really bad. OK, great, thanks. I'll ask this other question now because it's kind of related. How does one find a certified center? Is there a list? Yes, you can Google it and they have centers both in Trinidad and Tobago. OK, some of these centers will be New Life Ministries at Mount St. Benedict for men, New Life Ministries for women in Palo Seco. There's a Cora Hospital. There is a Reboot House. There's a Piparo Empowerment Center. Those are the main centers I know of, um, that but they have other centers too. Again, when you're looking for a center, it is important to check the program they're running, see whether they are family sessions, see whether there's an aftercare component. So there are certain things you would need to look for. What does the assessment look, look like? What kind of staffing do they have? And once you, you're able to do that, you will find that um, you may choose the right center. Now, some centers are total abstinence, like at New Life Ministries at Mount St. Benedict and Palo Seco, we are total abstinence, which means no nicotine, no caffeine, no mind or mood altering substances. There are other centers where they may still allow nicotine and caffeine. So they deal more with what is called harm reduction. And what harm reduction means? OK, I'm stopping marijuana, I'm stopping, stopping cocaine, but I will continue with my nicotine. So whatever would have been their drug of choice or their main behavior, behavioral addiction, they will minimize that and just live a normal life, but continue using something. So there's a difference between abstention and harm reduction. OK, great, thank you. OK, so our next question. So you spoke to males on addiction. Are teenagers, girls and women as addicted as men? And what is the common vice? Well, what you will find is that uh, people become addicted in their teens. And it starts, in fact, in our research, a lot of people start from nine years old. Between nine and 11 are the ages when kids start using some kind of substance or engaging in some addictive behavior. And as they go into teenage years, it intensifies. And so when you become an adult at 40, you already were using 20 years or, or 25 years. So addiction really starts before 25. And in our experience, if you started to use a substance after 25, let's say at 26 years old, you started to drink, you may not necessarily develop an addiction simply because when the brain is still forming and we start using a substance or we are engaging in a behavior, the brain, if to use a simple term, it latches on to, that, to your brain. 
So you may find that it becomes part of your, your system. And that is why it takes it's so difficult to treat an adult person because they have been so addicted for so long without any kind of help. And that is why we, we tend to want to do more prevention programs or we try to encourage people to bring their, their teenagers into program before it develops into an addiction. Women are, are fully addicted and they, but the problem with women is that they tend to be, it tends to be a hidden secret because women gets enabled a lot. Uh, male partners, firstly, will introduce them to substances. And secondly, because you might be young and beautiful and, and you might be gifted and talented in some way, you may find yourself into relationships and men may just, you know, help you along. So it is only when your situation becomes really bad, where you're down and out, you have no money, you have no friends, then most likely a relative, maybe a parent or a sibling will rescue you and bring you into a center. And that has been our experience in our women's center. But very few women will just get up one day and decide, you know, I need help and I'm going to check myself in. Some do, but the majority are brought in when things are really bad with them medically and psychologically. OK, great, thank you. Our next question, how can you assist someone who is independent in terms of their finances and their living arrangements and they're isolated or they're at some distance? That is such a challenge. Again, if the person is independent and isolated, there must be somebody somewhere that this person has some connection with. Maybe a, a relative, a friend, a, um, a priest, a pastor, a, a pundit, somebody who has a connection with this person. And you have to allow or get that person to reach that person and over a period of time to talk to them about getting help and arrange maybe for someone to see that person in a non-threatening way. Say, no, I just wanted to talk to this person to see whether there's anything we can do to help you. But it has to be a real gentle approach because remember, this is a person who tell themselves, I don't have a problem. Um, I'm minding my own business, don't mind my business. And so they may be deep in denial. That is a long-term process and that is one of the most difficult cases to actually deal with. But the, the, the door you can open is have somebody whom they trust or know or who can reach them to start that conversation. OK, agreed. This next person is just asking if you could share a list of the behavioral addictions again. OK, well, I don't have that content with me, but if you, if you go to the first webinar, uh, maybe Renee can uh, make it. I think it's already on, is it? Yeah, on the first webinar, on, yeah. It, yeah, we have a full list. So if you go there, you would see the content. Um, or, or if not, you can leave, the, you know, a contact information on Renly and we can always forward the PowerPoints to you. I don't remember them all fine. OK, no problem. Yes, that can work. All right, let's move on then to the next question. What suggestions do you have regarding food addiction? Well, Food addiction really comes from some deep seated issues. The reason why somebody may, one of the reasons why somebody may develop a food addiction is because they are engaging in emotional eating. And emotional eating is related to other psychological issues that are unresolved within the person. That is one. Secondly, what we have found is that a large extent based on our people we treat, that food addiction tends to, to develop as a result of some form of abuse. So we don't treat the food addiction on the surface. What we do is we get this person psychological help, like psychiatric assessment first to see what 